just a, a disclaimer before we start. Any resemblance of anybody in this room to the title of today's talk is purely coincidental. And I must say, when I came in, when every time I come here, and this is about the fifth or sixth time I've been here, and thank you for your faith and trust in the fact that I will be uh, allowed to preach in this church. I, I'm, I never get to preach in my home. So, I mean, this is my home city, Stoke, but where I've lived in 1973 is in Liverpool, and they won't have me. So you're the only one, people who will have me. So anyway, <laughs> but I felt like a dinosaur when I came in today because I tried to understand what Rich was saying about computer technology, and I'm lost. So um, if, if things go wrong, um, you can blame me, but uh, I, I really don't know what I'm doing half the time. Right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word of truth, Lord. Forgive us, particularly those, Lord, within the church who would, would substitute the, the ideas of human reason, of sinful man's thoughts and understanding over against the, the unchanging word of Scripture, once for all delivered to the saints. Help me, Lord, today to put this through clearly, we trust in what you have said. And Father, we look at this subject now, which has misleads so many, particularly young people. And I pray, Lord, at the end of this talk, uh, we'll be clearer and more trusting in what you have said. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title is Dinosaurs in the Bible, but I'm going to start by showing you a clip um, from the biased broadcasting, uh, sorry, the BBC. Actually, the latest, the latest, the Hamas Broadcasting Corporation. Right. This is a short film. It's about three minutes long. And there's a lot wrong with it, basically. Um, and I'll let you see if you can work out what's wrong with this. What's wrong with my eye? Is it maybe? Okay. Now, this is called The World of the Dinosaurs. <clears throat> The lady presenting this, you'll know her because she's a, um, a household name if you... Oh. We have ways of making you understood. Thank you for that. The lady presenting this will be, might be well known to you. Her name is Professor Alice Roberts, Birmingham University. She is the Vice President of the Humanists UK. That's exactly what we're fighting in the church. The... the, the the thoughts of sinful human beings. Watch this. Oops. What should I put on the... Uh... How do you start to get close to animals that lived hundreds of millions of years ago? Dinosaurs. 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 Dinosaurs weren't just giant lizards, but a truly unique kind of reptile. Dinosaurs roamed for more than 150 million years. Dinosaurs roamed in amazing shapes and sizes. Very few left evidence of their existence. And those bones never cease to fascinate us. The more we find, the more complete our understanding. Utterly awe-inspiring. The world of the dinosaurs. There are always new discoveries out there. Waiting to be found. Waiting to be found. The more we find, the more complete our understanding. Utterly awe inspiring. The world of the dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, the largest flesh eater the world has ever seen. The best dinosaurs, or better all the dinosaurs, followed a well trod trail to oblivion. Rock layers span the age of dinosaurs. The deeper the layer, the older the rock. At the top, rock from the Cretaceous. Below that, the Jurassic. And near the bottom, Red Triassic Badlands. When dinosaurs first appeared, when dinosaurs first appeared, the more we find, the more complete our understanding, utterly awe-inspiring, the world of the dinosaurs. Sixty-five million years 
years ago. The meteorite smashed into the earth. Hurtling toward our planet. At 100,000 kilometers a second. If we'd never found their bones, we wouldn't ever have known. These ancient animals ever existed in their bones. We wouldn't ever have known. These ancient animals ever existed. The more we the more complete our understanding. Utterly awe-inspiring. The world of the dinosaurs. There are always new discoveries out there. Waiting to be found. Waiting to be found. The more we find, the more complete our understanding. Utterly awe-inspiring. The world of the dinosaurs. There are always new discoveries out there. And it's all inspiring, the world of the dinosaurs. Well, <clears throat> that's littered with a number of scientific errors. Science of an observation, this so-called meteorite that hit the Earth 65 million years ago. Anybody see that? I mean, it's just, it's, it's conjecture. It's, it's basically um, speculation. And what I want to do today is to take you through actually what the scripture says. So, um, yeah, you'll see as we go through this presentation that um, this is not the truth of God. And if that's the limit of your knowledge about dinosaurs, it's, it's, it's spectacular. How many people saw the film Jurassic Park? Anybody go and see Jurassic Park? I mean, it's a well-made film. But don't get, as Christians, let's not get our understanding from, from cinema. Let's get it from Scripture. And that's what I'm going to uh, take you through in this talk. Any questions at the end? Um, Tim will answer them. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, start with some pictures of dinosaurs, but notice on, that presenta on the presentation there, there was a lot of uh, speculation as what they looked like. Um, we can see... The fossils. Has anybody ever been um, heard this? Christians don't believe in dinosaurs. Absolute nonsense. It's nonsense. But well, I'll, I'll explain why. Because of the long ages of supposed existence of dinosaurs, dinosaurs were only discovered at the um, right at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. Actually, in in Britain first by a lady called Mary Anning. Have you heard of Mary Anning? Yeah? Um, she was, um, um, you know, a good researcher. She dug out from the cliffs near Lyme Regis in Dorset, if you've ever been to the, to the south coast. Um, she dug out these huge bones. And, of course, it was the time just coming up to Darwin's theory of evolution. And, of course, they're going to fit that in. And that maybe if dinosaurs had been discovered in Bible days, dinosaur bones, fossils, um, then the situation would have been different today. Unfortunately, it was just the wrong time. Now, these are just artist's impressions. I'm not going to, to leave you with these very long. There's another one. There's a human being standing... Oh, that looks a daisy. There's a, there's a human being standing on that picture. And, of course, you see the scale. There's obviously a an elephant or a mammoth, uh, but then there are much larger creatures. T-Rex is the one, of course, you'll have heard of. Perhaps the best. We'll look at that later. See, again, that's a, an artist's depiction. But I suppose it does give you an idea of the scale. Um, in a way, I'm glad I didn't do this presentation uh, six months ago because I went to see in London, I was down in London in, in September. I went to the exhibition at the Natural History Museum and I saw a titanosaur skeleton reconstruction, probably. Um, and the titanosaur was discovered in the very southern tip of South America, what's called Patagonia, south of Argentina, right in the, on the bottom end of Argentina, Chile. And uh, these make Brontosaurus, which I think that's Brontosaurus, and T-Rex look tiny. The titanosaur, wait, wait and see. So dinosaurs certainly existed, whoops, too far there. I mean, that is probably from the Natural History Museum. 
But this, there was a, a special exhibition which you had to pay for. Um, and I thought it would certainly be good to take some photos. So dinosaurs certainly existed. We don't say there were no dinosaurs. My theory, though, is this. The Bible says, on day five, God made the sea creatures and the birds. That would have included flying dinosaurs. You may have heard of Archaeopteryx, although whether that's a dinosaur or not, I don't know. I doubt. Um, and on day six, he made the land creatures. The um, sea creatures were the sea dinosaurs, the plesiosaur. There was one washed up the other year, uh, somewhere in the, in the area of the Philippines. And it was probably a plesiosaur. Okay? Um, they were made on day five of creation. Day six, God made the land animals and man. So my thesis is this. Dinosaurs and people lived together for a while. Creatures now are going extinct. I'm not sure the white rhino isn't extinct. So, you know, they say, oh, this, this is way before human history. I, I'm not, I think that's wrong. Anyway, here's the first picture from the exhibition I went to. This was the titanosaur. And that was taken uh, rather badly with my phone camera. But you'll see another picture in a minute which shows the scale. Let's have a look at an, another couple of pictures of this. Uh, that was within the exhibition. And there are people sort of, sort of bottom slightly to the left to give a, a, an idea of scale. And that makes T-Rex and Brontosaurus look, look tiny. Oh, there's just the leg bones. And again, there's a, there's a person on the, on the picture. They were just the leg bones of the, of the dinosaur. So they certainly existed. But when the Bible talks about time, and it does not talk about evolution, things getting better. It talks about, if you like, about devolution, decay. Romans 8 talks about God subjected the creation to frustration. And I think things are less big than they used to be. Now, wait a minute. People are better fed now. The nutrition is better. But I suspect that people were bigger then. There aren't any nine-foot Goliaths these days. There are no giants in, in the land, yeah? But there were in Bible days. We know this, the descent of Anak, for example. Anyway, this is all linked in with um, the idea of entropy, which I've spoken about in a previous talk. There's the Titanosaur. You probably, I'm not sure you can read that. Um, I'll read it for you. Uh, millions of years... <laughs> this, of course, is the caption from the exhibition. Millions of years ago, that's completely out of the air. No scientific evidence at all. Dinosaurs um, roamed a world teeming with a variety of life. This is just what we saw in that, um, that film. Winged pterosaurs flapped overhead. Insects buzzed in the undergrowth. Lizards basked in the heat. It's just poetry. It's just for the children. It's just a gigantic titanosaur um, towered over all other dinosaurs, their long necks stretching high, feet from the dense evergreen canopy. I mean, some of the so-called science of dinosaurs, uh, even you get in schools, is completely wrong anyway. The idea, dinosaurs got long necks because they had an evolutionary advantage because they could reach higher up the trees to get the leaves. You cannot pass on that characteristic because it's, it's, it's in the DNA. You can only pass on inherited characteristics. You can't learn things during your lifetime. This is called Lamarckism. You can have a look at it. Um, a French scientist around 1800 said, you know, the, you know things got long, giraffes have got long necks because they stretch. Same reason. It's, it's fabrication. By the way, the giraffe has got as many, exactly as many neck bones as we have, seven. It's just they're bigger than ours. And they can rotate more because they're designed by a great creator. Anyway, the, I, I won't read all that because it's, um, again, 101 million years. 101 million. Oh, they've been trying to be more specific. Huh? Um, anyway, the heaviest animals ever to have walked the earth. It says... A new species was recently discovered uh, by an Argentinian farmer. Yeah, that's the discoverer of them in, in South America. 
How did these colossal animals survive? Such an enormous size. Step into this uh, di titanosaur's story and discover what. Yeah, it's 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 all complete speculation. Okay. Um, sorry, I, I, there's a mistake on this slide, but never mind. It was, it was actually on the film. Dinosaurs evolved from smaller reptiles around 230 million years ago, the Cretaceous, um, not followed by the Jurassic and Triassic. It should have been preceded by the Jurassic and... Uh, the, there's the word Jurassic for you. Uh, they became the dominant animal species on the planet, both on land and the sea and the air. And, of course, this is a, a theory. Birds evolved from dinosaurs. You hear that? It's complete nonsense. Well, I think we look at it later in the talk, but just one thing. Dinosaurs have got solid bones. They're big and heavy. Birds, they would never go off the ground. They're like the early attempts at flight. You know, just... Um, bones, um, birds' bones are hollow. Birds breathe when, as they go through the air. Some of them don't land for, from, for weeks, as though when they're migrating. Um, they they breathe in an air sac in one end and out the other, so the their their lung goes straight through. As ours we breathe in, and we breathe out. Yeah, and so do dinosaurs. Birds are completely different. Why anybody believes that I'm not not sure. And well, we'll look at scales and feathers later. So what's the theory? Well, they died out suddenly around 65 million years ago, a result of a catastrophic event. Uh, the large meteorite, it's called the KT extinction. Um, I think um, somewhere in Mexico, the um, no, there was nobody around at the time. Ridiculous. These time scales are just sent literally out of the air. They just put them out of the air. Um, and then climate change, because all to do with climate change, isn't it? Everything today is climate change. I was wet this morning as I was driving down from Liverpool. I spray. Oh, it's climate change. E.g. an ice age, early pre-human mammals preying on their eggs. Yeah, well, dinosaurs, we know that there aren't any dinosaurs around today. There are some reptiles. Let's read on. So this isn't science. This is speculation. There's a picture of the so-called meteorite. It would have, you know, if it had happened, which it didn't, um, it could have been spectacular. Okay, what's the Christian view? Well, as we've said, birds... Dinosaurs were made on days five and six of creation week. That's what the Bible says. Start with that. Start with that. Don't overlay what scripture says and try and say it's poetry. You know, Genesis is not poetry. Genesis is history. I think I'm sure I said this last time. When we divide up the Old Testament, and the first five books are the law, that's the Torah, the law, the Pentateuch. And then we say the next 12 are from, from Joshua onwards up to the end of Second Chronicles, that's history. We're actually saying that Genesis isn't history. You see the point? You know, the law, that's law. And of course, it's mythological. We can't take it seriously. But yes, you can. If you have any questions on this, please stay behind and, and talk to me. So what's, what does the Bible say? Well, like all creatures, they were given, they were originally created to be vegetarian. Oh, look at those teeth of that T-Rex. Well, you need big, long tusks to tear leaves as well as to tear flesh. I don't think just having large teeth makes you a carnivore. Anyway, um, originally there was, they were not hostile to people. Remember after, the, after the, the fall, God said the animals, there'll be basically fear will come in and there will be predation, which means animals feeding on other animals. And say they appeared after birds, the land dinosaurs. Okay, now, yeah, there were at least two on Noah's Ark. And all the ones that then existed after that sprung from those two. They could have been young ones, baby ones. You know, how did they fit the dinosaurs on the Ark? They didn't have to be titanosaurs. Actually, the average size of a dinosaur is about the same as a sheep. There were quite a lot of small ones. They're not all big. The big ones, because we are more spectacular, they're the ones we know. And they became as uh, extinct as species do today as a result of predation, yeah, hunting, and generally because of the fall. In the end, God has, is limiting animal size. A lot of creatures now were much bigger then. We find fossils, we find 
I'm trapped in amber um, and, and, you know, and then large insects, you know, with wingspan like this. Glad there aren't any, any wasps around that size these days, to be quite honest. I say praise the Lord. Okay, why is the word dinosaur not in the Bible? Well, it's a very, very simple answer. It's only, the word only arose in 1841. And it comes from two Latin words, Danos and Saros, means terrible lizard. And it was coined by that man who was, who mentioned the Natural History Museum. He was um, a scientist, prominent scientist, Sir Richard Owen, around the time of the first postage stamp, 1840, 1841. And so only less than 20 years before Darwin put pen to paper and wrote Origin of Species. So it's a new word. You, know, you won't find it in the Bible. There was no word for it. But there are words in the Bible, and two of them at the bottom. And they're both in the Old Testament. They're both in the book of Job. And other places, they're also in Psalms as well. So, so behemoth and Leviathan. And these creatures, well, anybody got an NIV Bible? Who's got an NIV Bible with them today? Right. Have a look at um, Job chapter, I think it's chapter 40, 40 or 41. And see what it says about the words behemoth and Leviathan. The book of Job is probably the first book of the Bible that should be written. Now, don't get me wrong, it describes events after the flood. So it wasn't written at the time of, of creation. But uh, Moses was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write that, perhaps later. But Job may well have been the first book of the Bible. And so, so chapter 40, verse 15 to 24, the behemoth, and there might be a little footnote. Does anybody want to say what that footnote is? Possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. Okay, elephant or hippopotamus. What about leviathan? Uh, that's show 41. Crocodile, yeah. So what the translators of the NIV, which would be 70s probably, um, have done is they've just said, what's the biggest animal we've got around now? As if everything that we, that's important is, is now visible to us. Well, things die off all the time. And the dinosaurs certainly had disappeared by then. So, Behemoth and Leviathan. So, yes, there's the quote. Now, what's an interesting... The picture, by the way, again, is, is an artist's depiction... And it's probably a, a brontosaurus with a big long neck and a, quite a small head. So the behemoth eats grass like an ox. And see now his strength is in his hips, his power in his stomach muscles, his tail like a cedar tree. Now, who's been to Chester Zoo recently? Anybody seen a hippopotamus or an elephant with a tail like a cedar tree? What do you think? Its bones are like the beams of bronze, ribs like the bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring him near his sword. Again, that's poetic language. But does that fit the elephant or the hippo? Well, there's the, there we are. Have a look, rather pathetic tail in my view, isn't it? It's, the, it's rather like, you know, it's, I mean, the trunk is more prominent than the, the tail. And as for the hippo, well, big, big fat creature. We don't want to run into one on a, a dark night. Um, but, um, yeah. So, what do you think? I mean, so here's a couple of pictures here, which make it, which make you laugh, I hope. So there's the hippo and the, and the elephant with a big little tail like a cedar tree. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? So, Leviathan, is this a crocodile? The Hebrew word is just, you know, just a Hebrew word in the Old Testament. There wasn't the word dinosaur. Um, Leviathan has, has come into our language in, in other ways. So they reckon this was a plesiosaur. And uh, in the Psalms and in Isaiah, not just the book of Job. And, of course, Isaiah would be written 700 BC, so long after the events of, um, of the book of Job, Psalm I remember Psalm 74, Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is a really wonderful psalm, by the way, about creation. 
And um, interesting, in verses 18 and 21 of Job 41, there is a hint of um, fire breathing. And I want to introduce you to the word dragon. Now again, like, and we'll see this in a second when I look at a unicorn, oh, these are mythical creatures, this is for children's storybooks. You know, dragons, there aren't any fire-breathing dragons today. You know, creatures can't uh, breathe fire. Are you sure about that? Who's ever heard of the bombardier beetle? How does it kill its prey? The answer is, it's an amazing chemical reaction involving uh, hydrogen peroxide. That's what I used to try and bleach my hair with. You see the result. Um, <laughs> peroxide, it's more, more the ladies than the, 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 the gents actually use peroxide. Um, and uh, a quinoquinone family of chemicals. And they make a mixture which literally explodes and it blows out of the back end of the bombardier beetle and kills its prey. It's going to blow out the right end, otherwise the bombardier beetle will be chewed up. 600, listen to this, 600 degrees Celsius. 600. That's hotter than water from boiling a kettle. That gets to 100 and then the energy goes to separate the molecules. It doesn't get any hotter unless, it's, unless you put in a steamer, which is where the steam is trapped. So... The bombardier beetle. What about the electric eel? How does that kill its prey? So to say we, you can't get sort of energy in terms of heat and light is, in nature, is, is quite wrong. So, focus on the word dragon for a while. Now, this is a controversial one. If it's true that dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago, People could not have seen them. But I'm going to show you the next few slides. And right at the end, when you, before you go, do take a handout. It's a single sheet. And it gives you evidence of what I'm saying is true. If people have depicted dinosaurs by, in artwork, in painting, in um, you know, cave paintings, in uh, representations, sculpture, then... People and dinosaurs around the same time. Animals don't do art. It's one of the things that makes man not an, an, not an animal. Is we do art. We have there's a concept of beauty and pleasure. We have a, what's called an aesthetic sense. It's part of a, part of the spirit of God within us, as well as our conscience. I don't like this idea that man is just an evolved animal. We're just the end of a long line. We're not. We're special. God breathed His spirit into into Adam. And Adam was made from the dust. He didn't have a, a human dad. Okay, so, yeah, in yellow. If evidence were found to show that dinosaurs and man coexisted, the theory of evolution would collapse. Wouldn't it? That's what, they, that's what they, they're resting their case on. They're millions of years old. The, the Earth, the universe is 15.8 billion years Earth, about 5 billion. Life on Earth, well, you saw those ages of the, um, the rock layers. Again, they're completely wrong. Well, there's a picture at the bottom there. And if you go to, not that far from here, to Carlisle, straight up the M6, you go up to Carlisle and go into the cathedral, and you probably have to ask for the carpet to be removed. But on the floor is a representation of a tomb, well it's not a representation, it's the tomb of one of the bishops of Carlisle, Bishop Bell, yeah? And if you look at this, you see there are two dinosaurs fighting. Now let me show you a better picture. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I'll come back to Bishop Bell's tomb. It's on that handout, by the way. Is that a stegosaur? Well, it's a large creature, looks a bit like hippo on the right, but... Yeah. Big tail and scales on the back, and what people call a steg stegosaur. And we have found fossils, fossilized stegosaurs. I mean, the dinosaur discoveries, you're only talking about the last 200 years, and just over, perhaps just over 200 years. But we've certainly found these. This is in um, Cambodia, it's on a, a Buddhist temple, and it's a little picture of. A creature. Oh, it's just some artistic, you know, not meant to be realistic. 
Well, those scales on the back look fairly realistic to me. Uh, that's a little model that was found in Mexico. Um, it's on a website called, if you uh, put that in, you'll get some pictures. Uh, I don't know what it's quite what it's made of. It's a little, like, ornament. And uh, look, again, looks like a dinosaur, doesn't it? Well, it certainly isn't um, a, crocodile, a crocodile or an elephant. Um, this is what's called a petroglyph. That is um, done on rock. Um, now, what the atheists will say is that um, it was a picture of a, um, of a large creature and then the, the ink ran or something like that, whatever they used to, to get the image on the rock. Uh, it's in Utah in the USA. Um, I think, again, it is on that handout I've, I've, uh, available to everybody when you go. If people depicted dinosaurs, they had to be living at the same time. Oh, yes, right, there, there we are. A sauropod is just a type of um, land-dwelling uh, dinosaur. And the atheist explanation, yes, the, 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 whatever you got they used to stain the rock and create the picture has run down and, of course, well, no evidence for that other than their own, their own existing theory. Oh, there it is, yeah, back to Bishop Bell's tomb in the cathedral. Yeah, um... It's bronze, I think, so it makes sort of glows, a sort of yellowy colour. Um, but again, if you look at the tails of those creatures, um, if you, I think there's um, something in the museum about the, um, about this particular tomb. They probably hidden it up because creationists are using it to justify their, you know, position. We can't have that. You know, we must, you know, keep everybody thinking evolution is right. Um, it probably says two dogs fighting. Well, even dogs, I don't think, have got tails. Like that. Go and see for yourself. And then human footprint, footprints inside dinosaur footprints. That's interesting. This is the um, this in Texas. This is the Paluxy River, and um, when when these um, rocks were forming, probably um, sometime after the flood, sometime just after the flood, maybe the rocks were still getting sort of sorted out. There were dinosaur prints, and then within the dinosaur print is a human print, footprint. Again, man and dinosaurs lived together. Let's look at birds now. That picture on the right is just a, an artist's representation. Um, well, the answer is no. Here's some evidence why. Archaeopteryx was, was certainly a bird. Oh, yeah, birds are warm-blooded, reptiles are cold-blooded. First big difference. Uh, bones have hollow bones, dinosaur bones are solid. Birds breathe, yeah, that's what I mentioned about breathing through one end of their lungs and exhale at the other end so they can breathe while they're flying. Makes sense. God is a great designer. Um, I mean, Richard Dawkins has a cheek to talk about, you know, God's bad design. Who the heck is he? He will answer to the Lord one day. Um, so our lungs are like reptiles are sack with one opening, we breathe in, we breathe out. Feathers are not the same as, as scales. They, they say, well, feathers evolve from scales. Scales are made of something called collagen. Uh, it's just a protein, and um, they grow. Um, uh, yeah, what have I read there? Yeah, so they're just flaps of skin, mainly collagen. Birds have feathers, and feathers can grow like hair, uh, which I had the secret, um, and um, from a, what they call a follicle, a, a hair follicle. Um, Archaeopteryx has feathers. I was originally, classi originally classified as a bird, and then pressure came from the evolutionists. Find us a missing link. Oh, we'll re we'll reclassify that as a dinosaur. It's a, a flying dinosaur, flying reptile. Um, was it ever thought of as a reptile initially? Well, no, it was a it was a bird. So did birds evolve? Now these are this on the on the left of the top is is a feather. Feathers are actually really well designed. Whether you've ever seen them under a microscope, I think the next slide shows this. Um, and they said, you know, bird feathers arrive from evolved from reptile scales. Is this plausible? No, they're completely different. Here's let's have a look at a feather. Feathers got. Um, 
tiny, what they call barbie, barbs and barbules. And it's the principle which engineers have discovered to make Velcro, make Velcro stick. The barbs and the um, barbules, they're called ridges, ridges and hooks, and they connect to allow it to, to slide and move. It's a, it's a marvellous creation by a master designer whose name was Jesus Christ, by whom all things were made. Yeah? Uh, there's a preening gland. They never knew what for years why a bird sort of swiveled its neck and pecked around its back. It's, it's getting oil. There's a gland there. And it keeps the feathers, and then they preen the feathers to keep them waterproof. Fantastic. And they didn't discover that for years. And um, the preening gland will stop um, this getting frayed. So that's why a bird preens its feathers. And it's, it's the feather I put... Perfectly aerodynamic, light, flexible, and wind resistance. And reptile scales are not the same. They're just flaps of skin. A feather is in irreducibly complex. It cannot suddenly... You suddenly get the DNA for... Oh, there's a DNA for a feather now. A mutation. No, don't, don't be silly. That's ridiculous. You cannot evolve a, an, organ, an organ, which feathers are like that, without... Divine input. And here's the, the killer. And this is really just the last 25, 30 years. This lady, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, she, again, she's mentioned on the sheet, I've, which I hope you'll all take. You can take copies of anybody who's not here. Take a copy for them. And it says, when she discovered, uh, she was in, um, I think, Wisconsin, uh, oh, no, hang on, Montana, um, the north, one of those northern uh, states of the USA and uh, near the Canadian border, quite remote, not very populous. Um, she found in an area where they'd found lots of dinosaur uh, fossils in the past, she found a uh, T Rex bone from um, the discovery, and they tend to saw them in half so they can photograph them. And she noticed red blood cells and even containing visible nuclei. Um, only the white cells, of course. The red cells don't have a nucleus. And she said this. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. Why? Because she's got a theory in her head. Oh, it's, 60, it's got to be 65 million years old. Hang on. That one discovery should have knocked that theory on the head immediately. How can blood cells survive this long? Well, the answer is, they didn't. Your, your paradigm is wrong. And this is the problem. Evolution is a straitjacket, a filter through which discoveries have to go. And if, if not, they'll be rejected. Um, I'm going to lend this to Alex, if he knows about it. This is a film, not, not made by a Christian. Anybody ever seen this film? It's called Expelled. And basically what it does, it exposes Richard Dawkins for a start. And um, it basically says if you discover something like this that's, that's radical, that causes people to totally rethink their worldview, oh, well, we can't have that. We'll suppress it. And you say, there's, you say you're a young earth creationist, right, you're out of a job. We're cutting off your grant. There's pressure put on. They're expelling people who tell the truth because, oh, it fits in with the Bible. We can't believe the Bible. And that's what we're facing. Not intelligent, objective thinkers. Oh, yes, you know, you're a good scientist. No, if you tick the wrong box, you're cancelled. And that's what's happening in America and probably happening in Britain too. Yeah. So even though there's got, you've got something that's quite obviously not 65 million years old, it has to be another way. So there's some of the pictures. Um, first of all, the colour uh, is, is, is the right colour. I know there's the rocks like hematite have got similar colour. But let me look at another picture. Oh, too far there. Right. In the close up, some ideas die hard. Yeah. So here's the quote again. I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones are, after all, 65 million years ago. 
How could blood cells survive this long? So, oh, it must be a new mechanism we don't know about yet. No, 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 you've gone down the wrong, you've gone down the wrong road. The road is, it's not old. Oh, well, you know, we'll get in trouble with our fellow evolutionists, atheists. Science isn't as objective and intelligent as you think. So there's another Mary Schweitzer. When you think about it, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know say that it should be gone. It should be degraded. Completely to degrade means to break up. I mean, well, later on, uh, there's a man who's going to talk to us right at the end. I started with a, a video. I'm going to finish with a video. Um, he's a professor of chemistry in I think Canada, Vancouver, Canada. And he says this is just dynamite for the evolutionist. Degrade means to break down. And he uses the analogy of meat. Has anybody got a freezer here with meat 20 years old in it? So if you can't even preserve meat at 20 years old, that's minus 30 Celsius, the best freezers, minus 30, you wouldn't eat it, would you? It should be degraded. It will go off even when it's frozen. Now, here's another one. Carbon-14, I think I mentioned this in one of my other talks. Carbon-14 is the radioactive form of carbon. All our bodies, most of our mole um, biomolecules in our body are based on carbon, apart from water, which of course is the most common chemical in our bodies anyway. 70% of our body is, is, is weight is water. Um, but carbohydrates and fats and proteins and hormones and, and uh, nucleic acids, DNA... Uh, they're all based on carbon. We know there isn't much carbon-14 in, 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 in nature. About one part in a trillion, one in every 10 to the 12 carbon atoms in your body is radioactive. Don't worry. You won't glow in the dark, okay? But there is carbon-14, and it decays very slowly. Well, not that slowly, actually. Half-life, the half-life are 5,730 years, plus or minus a few. When you, we're alive, we exchange carbon with the environment. I eat crisps, probably too many. But the crisp comes from the potato. The potato gets its carbon from the potato plant, which is photosynthesis um, from the sunlight. Basically, the, everything in nature that's living contains the same very small amount of carbon-14. When a creature dies, it stops taking in carbon, but the carbon-14 that's already there breaks down with this half-life, 5,000 years. Let's look at some of the maths of this. If there's only one part in a trillion there in the beginning, after 50,000 years, that's 10 half-lives, how much is left? Well, 2 to the power 10 is 1,024. So there's another factor of... 10 to the 3. So it's 10 to the minus, 10 to the fifth, 1 in 10 to the 15 is carbon. Basically, you get down to one carbon atom in the whole fossil. You can't date rocks this way. Rocks aren't living. It has to be something that was living, yeah? Which means a fossil. So if dinosaurs had been around for 65 million years ago, there wouldn't be any carbon 14 left by now. And there is. Now, this is where. This DVD comes. I'm going to show you a clip from this at the end. Who was it I gave this to? Somebody in the congregation has got one of these. Yes. Where's it now? Have you passed it on? Please do. Yeah, because it's dynamite. And this was done by, one of the work on this was it's being done by Professor Steve Taylor at Liverpool University. He's the Professor of Electrical Engineering, a friend of mine. He believes he's a believer, Christian. An elder of the evangelical church in Liverpool. He's getting sort of flack for this. And he's been measuring the amount of carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. I won't dwell on this page. This is called accelerated mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometer carbon dating. And you take a bone, uh, mash it up, um, acidify it probably, yes. Acetic acid, that's vinegar. Acidic. Um, CO2 will 
sort of bubble, bubble away. And then you treat the sodium hydroxide. Uh, it was a very strong alkali, think of oven cleaner. Do you remember the case about a couple of months ago where some, um, here's some migrant and we got a woman pregnant and there was a child and he went down from Newcastle to London, South London, and threw a chemical in her face and she's scarred. Remember that story? And then they found his body, suicide in the Thames. And they said it was an acid attack. It wasn't. It was an alkali attack. Probably sodium hydroxide, NaOH. Like oven cleaner. It would, don't go on your skin. So, oops. Um, anyway, they look basically, they're, they're looking at the um, karma 14 in collagen and in, in um, appetite. Two minerals. Um, you know your bones contain calcium. Calcium ions would be a better word. Um, don't do too much chemistry here. Anyway, um, if you look at the, the dates you get from the collagen and the, um, the, the appetite, they're about the same. I'll skip that. It's a bit technical. Oh, right. Now, this is interesting. There was a group until a few years ago of people researching this at Georgia State University, USA. Not Georgia, um, near Russia. Georgia State University. And they were just a PhD students. And they're working on this at carbon-14 ages for these dinosaur bones. And here are their results. Material tested. On the left, it says the name of the dinosaur. You'll have heard of Triceratops. Um, got th three horns on its nose. Um, Allosaurus, Hadrosaur, okay. Um, the initials are the um, State of, um, of America. So Montana, AK. Alaska, uh, CO will be um, Colorado probably, TX is obviously Texas. And here are the ages that they got from carbon dating. Maximum, 33,000, biggest number there. Smallest number in the middle, 2,560 years ago. Not that long ago, is it? I mean, it's BC, but not that much BC. That's interesting, isn't it? You know what happened to the group that were doing this research? They were told, oh, there's no more funding for it. Um, you go and do something else. Just like being expelled. They were coming up with results they didn't want, and they suppressed it. They cancelled it. That's what happens. Unwelcome news, yeah. We don't want this. So Mary Schweitzer now is trying to backtrack on her discoveries. Um... She's now, I don't think she was, she was doctor when she, she actually started finding these things. Anyway, for the past 20 years, I've been trying every experiment I can think of to disprove the hypothesis that these uh, materials I and my collaborators have discovered are components of soft tissues from dinosaurs. She's trying to basically... She's been corrupted by, you know, I, I've got, I can't think outside the box. The box says, the, the, the blinkers, so I'm going to carry on with my theory and make it fit. Anyway, she, ignore, ignore revise, uh, she has ignored advice from her fellow scientists. Her research was incomplete until she had tested for the presence of carbon-14 um, and ignored a request by the director of some museum, the Dinosaur and Fossil Museum, to do so. Um, and she said, not now. I'm not doing that experiment. I don't want the results I might get. This is what happens. It's a conspiracy. So why didn't she test for carbon-14? If she'd found no carbon-14, her case is strengthened. Do you know what I mean? That shows it's very old. Perhaps at least greater those ages on that um, slide. But she wouldn't do the tests because she's worried what might happen. And she might lose her tenure at the university. Okay, let's finish with this. Dragons. It's important we have the right images. Children's storybooks have the dragons and George and all that breathing fire. And maybe the creature top right looks a bit like an artist's representation. What about the petroglyph, the um, cave painting? down below it. Something coming out of its mouth, isn't there? 
as well as a couple of spikes. I don't think it's a camel. There's a couple of humps on the back, big long tail, and something coming from the head. Interesting, isn't it? Again, is, you know, oh, they're just making up this story. No, they're, they're depicting what they're seeing. And, you know, let's not be unfair on them. They're saying, oh, they're just lying. They knew what was going to happen a couple of thousand years later when we were going to be discussing it today. So we better, we better doctor the story, you know. They, 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 they painted what they saw. And I've said the bombardier beetle does breathe, breathe if you like, fire. Although it explodes it out of its, its bum. And electric eels, yeah. Now, a unicorn. Oh, we don't believe in unicorns. Who's got a King James Bible here today? Right. Do you know there are, just look on the Bible Gateway website, the, the, the app, very useful app. Yeah, they're, they're unicorns. But, oh, no, look at that, that, that postage stamp on the top left. It's not a horse with a spike coming out of its head. That's ridiculous. What's the word mean, unicorn? It means one horn. Uni, horn, one horn. And there is a one-horned rhinoceros. It's quite rare. There's a photograph of one. So that's a unicorn. Oh, that's not, uh, I expect to think of a unicorn. Well, that's the reality Top right, top left is, is fiction. So they say, oh, you, you know, you Christians believe in the unicorns. Well, depends what you mean by a unicorn. We don't believe in the, the one top left, the fictional one. But we do believe in a one-horned rhinoceros. And most of them have two horns. And nine times in the Bible, there's a reference there. And one in Isaiah, Isaiah 34, verse 7. Well, have a look at it. See what it says in your King James Bible. Now, and this, I think, is almost the last slide. I'm going to show you a little film for a few minutes. Right, from the Chinese to the Welsh, dragon stories abound in numerous unrelated ancient cultures. Lots of people spoke about giant creatures that really bear no relation to the elephant and the hippo. Bigger than that, or fearsome than that. And there's a... Um, um, uh, a scholar, I presume he was um, a believer, because he's Saint John Damascene, maybe from Damascus. And he wrote a book on dragons and ghosts. And what he was anxious to do was to distinguish truth from fable and legend. And he, he pointed out that dragons are real animals, created by God on the, on the sixth day, on the fifth day, without mythical status. See, this idea that you know, dragons are just my mythological, how do we know this? Now, he references a Roman historian. The Roman historian lived um, in his uh, millennium before John Damascene, and his name is Dio Cassius. Dio Cassius. And he, he was a historian, so he wrote down history. And in yellow is one of, an extract from one of his um, reports. It is this. One day when Roman consul Regulus was fighting against Carthage. You know that happened in around about the, um, yeah. Um, I think it was, was Hannibal, let me think. I can't remember anyway. A dragon, use the word for dragon then, suddenly crept up, settled behind the wall of the Roman army. The Romans killed it by order of Regulus, skinned it, sent the hide to the Roman Senate. I'm presumably back in Rome. Uh, Carthage is North Africa, by the way, so like um, Libya. When the dragon's hide, as Dio says, was measured by order of the Senate, it happened to be, amazingly, 120 feet long. And the thickness was fitting to the length. In other words, it wasn't just like tissue paper. So where they had that from? Too big for, a, for, for most creatures. And what I mean, maybe the you know the last dinosaur in the world, but and it was killed. He, you know, once we got technology like bows and arrows and spears and crossbows, and dinosaurs were, were were feared and were wiped out by people. Well, I'll leave you with all this. I want to show you to finish with 
But that's the end of the Bible bit. But it isn't really, because I'm going to show you now, if I can find the film, a clip from this um, um, DVD. It's my last one. I, I did have about 10. I've gradually given them all away. And I've got one left. So let's have a look at this. And it's about a four minute clip. And it's a scientist talking about the, the, the he's a chemist, talking about the chemistry of all this. Let's have a look at this. Oh, that's the narrator. He looks a bit wild, looks a bit like Crocodile Dundee. Um, but he's, he's a bit eccentric, isn't Joseph Hubbard? He's speaking at a conference I'm going to in uh, Birmingham um, in um, the end of, end of October this year. There's still time to book up if you want to go. Two days of uh, creation, right. So, Indiana Joe, right. Now, that, he isn't the scientist. It's coming, he's coming up. Sound. And things of soft tissue uh, being found in these in these dinosaur bones. What do, what do you know about uh, this soft tissue stuff? And um, you know, we'd like to discuss a bit more about like the half lives of this soft tissue and some of the stuff that's been that's been found. What can you tell us about that? In two thousand and five, Mary Schweitzer uh, reported finding some soft tissue, <laughs> uh, possible red blood cells, osteocytes, and she took a lot of heat for it. And, you know, the scientific community really didn't want to accept this because it was really outside their worldview. Like how possibly could these proteins and DNA and various other biomolecules survive millions and millions of years? I mean, everything has a shelf life. Even milk has a shelf life. And so, you know, if you found milk from 1940 and it was fresh, that would create some questions in your mind. Some of these things that we're finding in soft tissue like uh, red blood cells and even things like collagen when it comes to the half-life of that what are we looking at collagen can have a half-life of like 117 years has been reported when it comes to half-lives of soft tissue how would you be able to demonstrate what that length of time is when you talk about proteins proteins are meat i mean how long does meat last i mean you pretty much got to refrigerate it or freeze it um, the average protein, if you talk about proteins inside a living cell, the average half-life is 43 minutes. So in 43 minutes, you can lose half the amount of your protein. Now, that's not all proteins. That's the average protein. Um, if you take a look at collagen, it has a half-life of 117 years, as calculated. If you take a look at DNA, it has a half-life of 521 years. These are all from journal articles from good researchers who have published this in the literature. As an organic chemist, what do you find surprising about the survival of things like blood cells and soft tissue in dinosaur bones? Let me give you an analogy. Uh, we're walking in the deep woods and we find a cabin and we crack open the, the door and it's, it's, it's been abandoned for years. We walk in, there are newspapers from 1945 and we find an old fridge in there. And uh, inside the fridge, we find a milk carton. And it's from 1945. Oh my goodness. We crack open the milk. We expect it to be rancid, putrid. Instead, we pour the milk. We look at it. It looks good. It's absolutely fresh from 1945. Now, would you be surprised at that at all? Well, yeah, I think so, a little bit. Well, in the same way, when you look inside dinosaur bones and you find putative red blood cells and certainly some, some vessels that carry blood and osteocytes and collagen, and what are these things doing there? It's like finding fresh milk in a 1945 cabin. And so, yeah, there's a lot of surprise there. And that's why these results, when they were first published, were met with vehement displeasure by the scientific community. It's been reported that proteins consistent with the presence of DNA have been found in dinosaur remains. Do you believe these reports? I just find it very surprising that proteins would exist for that long. Proteins are meat. And even if I took like a, a fresh steak and put it in a freezer that I have downstairs at minus 40 degrees Celsius, 
it's only going to last so long before you can't eat that anymore. And it's, it's not measured in millions of years. It's measured in months, possibly a couple years, if you got a really good freezer. So if people are finding proteins uh, mixed in with DNA, and these are even fragments of proteins, what in the world are they doing there? They shouldn't be there. They should have long degraded based on their half-life. What do you think that says about the age normally assigned to these remains? These dinosaur bones may not be quite as old as we think that they are. Can you, as an organic chemist then, see any way that these or you know, soft tissue organic uh, bits of meat, essentially, could survive for this period of time? Uh, the question is this, just like with my milk example, I could do things to that milk to maybe give it a shelf life of six months if I was lucky. But it would be just sort of wrong to then extend my little analogy and say, well, because I was able to extend my milk's life by six months, it's now going to last millions of years. Let's be honest. Even if you can show that you can preserve something for, a, let's say, a couple more years, it's a stretch to take it to a million or 60 million or 300 million years. I don't see how you could say that with any confidence whatsoever. We're still uh, coming up against people who, who don't want to believe that this is real almost. Have you got any thoughts as to why that is? What could there be that causes people to almost disregard good science? If this is true, and it is, that there are soft tissues preserved in millions and millions of years old dinosaur bones, uh, this is contradictory to everything that they believe. And it may actually force them to reevaluate their worldview of everything. And as such, being the emotional creatures that human beings are, they're going to fight you tooth and nail to maintain their worldview. And that's why there's so much resistance. You know, this is just amazing stuff. Yeah. As a young scientist who's taking on the world of geology, it is so inspiring to speak to these men who are not afraid to challenge, who aren't afraid to go where the research takes them. Even Something called confirmation bias. We, we, are, we, are, we want to carry on believing what we believe. And so the bias is to say, oh, this, this can't be right. Every time I look at the BBC, of course, I, you know, uh, schools, textbooks, it's all, it's all fiction, folks. The only thing that is true is the word of the Lord that lasts forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these revelations. Help us to process them. Lord, we know that we ourselves might have problems, as I did for five years after I got saved, Lord. I tried to harmonize evolution and long ages with scripture. Father, thank you for freeing me from that. And Lord, thank you for giving me a God-centered view of, um, of, of life as we know it on this planet. Lord, we pray for those, particularly in churches, who are struggling with the issue. Help them to see clearly and to turn to the, to the one who embodies truth as well as the way and the life our Lord Jesus is the truth. Thy word is truth. Help us believe it, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.